how does your lifelong need for adrenaline factor in? Because, you know, I mentioned some of the things that you've reported on. It's no accident yeah. you were one of the first in Afghanistan and Iraq and, you know, all these hurricanes. You and, Like, it's no accident. It's no accident you were down at ground zero on 9-11. Like, there's something in you that's both a combination of lucky as a reporter, but also just, a, I don't know, an adrenaline junkie? Well, that for sure. Uh, I got a great uh, rush out of being there and 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 racing to scenes and and being first on the air and um, being in the middle of a of a Cat Four or Cat Five or or or, or a war zone. You know, I really did uh, feed off of it. And to me, it was it was such an honor and a privilege to to be in Iraq where I am right there with with Marines. Uh, their 20, the 20 year anniversary of that's Christian Galdabini, my cameraman in Iraq, and we were embedded with the third LAR and the 223 Marines. It's been 20 years. And I'm going to a couple of reunions in the next uh, couple of months because uh, these guys, you know, they, they invited me and I, I'm definitely going to go. Um, but it, it was uh, it was something that I definitely needed to do. I, I wanted to be the guy who was there. I wanted to tell those stories. And I was so glad that I had a chance to do it. But Megan, you know how it is. After 35 years as a journalist, it, there came a time when I kind of didn't want to have to leave home on a moment's notice again for a day, mm -hmm. a week, or a month. I, I didn't want to have to do that for another three years. Um, I guess I felt like I'd been rained on enough, that I'd been out the door enough, that I'd paid my dues, and it was, I felt like it was time for me to just take a little step back or maybe a big step back and just, I don't know, write a book. So I did. Mm -hmm. I wrote Chasing Catastrophe. And, it, you know, it's some of the greatest stories I covered behind the scenes, um, stuff that people didn't know happened, uh, stories that I never told before uh, that ha that occurred during some of these big events. And I'm, I'm proud of the book. It's uh, it, I think it's a good read. Everyone who uh, who I've spoken with who's read it uh, seems to think so. And I also recorded the audio version of the book. So it's my voice reading my book. I don't know if you've done that, Megan, but it's not easy to read a book out loud that you didn't write intending to read out loud. It's not like a TV mm -hmm. script. I mean, some of the sentences did, did, are page long. I did the audio on my uh, book, Settle for More. And I what I remember about it was like holding back tears in the sad scenes. You know, it was, it was a very, it was emotional for me. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because my first chapter is about 9-11 and, and I was, uh, I believe, the first reporter to go live uh, nationally uh, at the scene. And that experience the whole day was in the weeks and months that followed was so devastating and so uh, just difficult to handle. Uh, I poured my heart into the the chapter on 9-11. And at the end of the chapter, when I was reading it in the audio booth, I broke down. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't finish the end of the chapter. I started sobbing in, in the audio booth. And every, the guys who were in there were like, whoa, wh wh what do we do about this? And I just, I was like, I just needed a minute to compose myself. And I did. And then it took me a couple of tries to get through it. But I mean, it was I still get chills when I see video from that day uh, or or talk about it or, or or read about it. I mean, it's just, it's part of me. I definitely suffer PTSD from being in the dust cloud, from watching the towers fall and for, you know, trying to 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 make sense out of what was happening around us that day. It was just so awful. Um, but it was important for me to, to put it on paper. And um, I think it's a I think it's a powerful chapter. Oh, you you are one of the reasons. We know exactly what happened on 9-11. You were one of the few reporters actually there when the towers fell with the dust cloud, not knowing if you were about to live or die. Uh, and every year on FNC and all the channels, there, there would be a 9-11 retrospective. And your reporting was always featured heavily. I'm sure it still is. Cool. You with the dust all over you. We have a little bit of that. Let's show the audience. It's sought too. How close were you to the building when this I happened? was in front of the door of Five World Trade Center evacuating the people out of the building. And we got a lot out, and then it just blew. Back it up! 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 All right, here we go again. Here we go again. I, I don't know what's going on, but this, the second building is collapsing, I believe. I don't know. I don't know, but this, this happened before. We can see the top of the building from here. Oh, yeah. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. There it goes. There it goes. Oh. When it comes down, we're... All right. We do need to put it down now. I think we need to put it down now. Here we go. Oh my God. 
God, Rick. Chills watching that. That um, we had a tape rolling in the truck that day. Uh, one of the big one hour, three quarter inch videotapes, I think it was, or a half inch. And it recorded that whole thing that you just watched and, and everything else that happened. And somehow, Megan, I, I managed to hang on to that tape. And Fox is probably going to be knocking on my door for it. Uh, I, I don't know where it is right now, but mm -hmm. I was able to transcribe it. And on that tape are the four and a half minutes that Pat Butler, the engineer, and I spent inside the truck when we ran from the first cloud, from the first tower when it fell. Our conversation, you know, what the F is going on? We The phones don't work and Pat's trying to call and call and call and cursing and cursing. And we're like, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Like just a sheer chaos and confusion. And then we go back outside when the smoke starts to clear and it's a whole different landscape with that moon dust all over everything. And anyway, we, we were, I, I had the whole thing and I was able to transcribe it and that's in the book. And this is the first time that that, that conversation has been shared with with the world and I, I don't know i mean i just think it's it's compelling and it's and it's uh, a representation of just how insane that day was mm. the the instincts of a reporter come into direct conflict of the instincts of a man to survive right the reporter is told to stay in the midst of the danger and get the story and right. a human's instinct is to run and preserve your life, which you understood was definitely potentially in jeopardy in that moment. Yeah, but I wasn't going anywhere. Uh, I knew what my job was that day, and I knew that we were in a, a in a unique position to be able to report on uh, what was the biggest story in the world at that moment. And we didn't go anywhere except to hide in an alley the second when the second tower came down, and then we we're going right back out into the street and resumed our reporting. I mean, this was. Um, I knew I knew the importance. I, I knew the what we needed to do, and I and I just had to brace myself. You know, I had to put up that emotional wall and not let myself get caught up in in what a normal reaction would be, and just try to focus on what my job was, which was to try and separate rumor and fiction from fact, and relate to viewers what exactly was going on around us, which I did for I don't know fourteen or sixteen hours that day, and then. You know, every pretty much every day after that until I packed up and went off to Afghanistan. But, you know, I do give a lot of credit to uh, to the crews who were down there um, seeing the most awful things that they could have imagined seeing. And obviously, the most credit goes to the firefighters and police officers who were brave enough to rush toward the fire, trying mm -hmm. to save lives. And so many of them lost theirs. It was just it was uh, the worst day I've ever experienced. And uh you know, obviously the first chapter in my book. Like many people, I'm eating healthier these days, and that's why I love good olive oil. And by good, I mean fresh. Olive oil packs the most flavor and healthiest nutrients when it's fresh from the farm. And that's the problem with supermarket olive oils. They're not fresh. They can sit on the shelf for many months growing stale. That's why I like my olive oil direct from small, award-winning farms, thanks to a guy named TJ Robinson, also known as the olive oil hunter. When I tasted TJ's Farm Fresh oils, I fell in love with their vibrant, grassy flavors. They're delicious on salad, veggies, pasta, meat, fish, you name it. As an introduction to his Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club, TJ's willing to send you a full-size bottle worth 39 bucks of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils for just $1 to help him cover shipping. Best of all, there's never a commitment to buy anything, and you can cancel your membership at any time. Get your free $39 bottle for just $1 shipping and taste the difference freshness makes. Go to harvestfreshnow.com, harvestfreshnow.com for a free bottle and pay just $1 in shipping. Harvestfreshnow.com. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.